So basically, my title is Diabetes and Cancer, but um, what I'm going to talk about are two aspects, not just the connection between diabetes and cancer, but also some of the questions that have come up about cancer risk with the medications. You've heard some of it from um, Dr. Levy beforehand, and I'll cover perhaps other aspects, and then I'll skip over what she's already discussed so we don't uh, compete uh, or duplicate. So what I want to talk about is the epidemiology of diabetes and the increased risk of cancer. I'll then talk a little bit about the mechanisms whereby this can come about, and then I'll talk about some of the anti-diabetic agents, focusing on the ones you haven't heard about. So the first part is to tell you that there is a connection between being a diabetic, but also being obese, and having an increased risk of cancer, and increased risk of dying from the cancer. A lot of people with diabetes present with aggressive cancers, less responsive to chemotherapy, et cetera, and uh, the question is, first of all, is this correct and is it true? And what I've done here is I've summarized many of the factors that play into this connection. So if you're obese without diabetes, you have an increased risk of cancer and an increased risk of dying from cancer. If you have type 2 diabetes particularly, and the question of type 1 diabetes has not been resolved, but type 2 diabetics also have an increased risk of cancer. And obviously, if you're a type 2 and obese, there's a further increase. Now, obviously, if you're a diabetic, you're going to have hyperglycemia, hyperlipidemia, hyperinsulinemia, also if you're obese. And many of these factors could be causative. But there are other factors as well. Obviously, um, nutrients, because playing into obesity, insulin-like growth factor, leptin, which is often increased in obesity, seems to drive cancer cells as well. The reduction in adiponectin, which is what's happening in obesity and diabetes. Adiponectin is the good adipokine, and it's reduced in these situations. And that reduction, basically, you lose the protective effect of adiponectin on cancer. And then inflammatory cytokines, and if you're interested in uh, hormonal cancers such as breast cancer, which we are, uh, estrogen obviously plays a role. All of these can be abnormally elevated in patients with um, with type 2 diabetes and obesity and relate to cancer increase. Here is a study, uh, I haven't got the, the authors, Calais, published in the New England Journal, who showed in about 2012 um, and prior to that, showed that if you look at the cancers that are commonly found, so here are the cancers that are commonly increased in men and women who are obese. And you can see all of them listed here, the common cancers such as breast, colon, pancreas, ovary, and the same on this side. There's one cancer that doesn't seem to be increased, that's lung in both situations. And I have to point out that in prostate cancer in obese men, it seems to be reduced. And the possibility, although it's not proven, is that obese men have a reduction in androgens, and so they may have less prostate cancer. However, if you're a man and you have prostate cancer, and you're obese, you're likely to die faster than if you're a man who's thin with prostate cancer. So obesity plays into mortality, but also into the risk of developing cancers. Now, how can we prove that this is correct? Well, the way to do this is to remove the obesity. And there are a few studies, this one again from the New England, is a study, the Utah study, where they took 10,000 individuals who underwent bariatric surgery and compared it to 10,000 individuals who were treated by endocrinologists or nutritionists to try and lose weight. And so obviously the bariatric surgery was much more successful. But what did they find? They find that if you compare to the control group, if you're the surgical group with a successful reduction in weight, there's a reduction in all-cause deaths, reduction in cardiovascular deaths, less diabetes and deaths from diabetes, and lo and behold, less death from cancer. So if you're obese, you have more cancer, you're likely to die. If you remove the obesity, you reduce this risk. And I think there are other studies from Sweden and other places as well. So I think it's quite strong evidence that, at least from the epidemiological side, that truly there's this connection. The same with cancer and diabetes. It's been known for 100 years. Here, Maynard in uh, 1910 wrote that, indeed, there's a connection between cancer and diabetes. 
and if there was a common fact in the causation of the dual increase, in other words, he was saying we need to find out what this connection is. And this is the holy grail that many of us are looking for, um, to find out what the connection is between obesity, diabetes, and the increased risk of cancer. But this just shows you again, in diabetes this time, you'll see the increased risk. Liver cancers markedly increased. This is in men, pancreas, corp. In other words, a lot of cancers are increased in diabetic patients. And in women, of course, uterus, pancreas, and of breast cancer, et cetera, all increase significantly. So then the question is, if there is this epidemiological connection, what are the potential mechanisms? Here they are, potential mechanisms. Now, some of these are very specific to hormonal cancers, but some of them are generally specific to everything. And I've shown you already that insulin may be a major player because all of our obese, or at least most of our obese, and many of our diabetic patients have insulin resistance with hyperinsulinemia early in the disease. And we and others have shown that the insulin can be driving the cancer cell to grow through the insulin receptor. There are others that have shown as well that the insulin-like growth factor, IGF-1, also drives cancer growth. But as I said before, there are cytokines that may be important. Um, if you have hyperinsulinemia, you have a reduction in sex hormone binding globulin, so more estrad estradiol and testosterone that may be available to stimulate breast cancer or prostate cancer. And so there are multiple mechanisms that may be involved. And many people are trying to study to determine which of these play a major role in many of these situations. Now, when we talk about cancer, cancer progression, it's very important to remember that this whole process of going from a normal cell, an initiation of a cancer cell, which really occurs by these oncogenic mutations, whether it's due to some genetic form, whether it's irradiation, radiation, or whether it's other toxins, or just the mutation that's required to go from a normal cell to a cancer cell, followed by promotion and progression. And I think it's important to remember that this change over here is usually not by any of the factors I mentioned, and certainly not by any of the drugs that we mentioned, because this process takes a long time. And if you remember, most of the studies that I'm going to talk about and Dr. Levy spoke about are really short-term studies. It takes many, many years to develop these cancers. On the other hand, the agents that we can look at, like hyperinsulinemia, IGF-1, leptin, etc., these can affect the promotion and then the progression of the disease. So once you have the cancer, you can affect it by the factors I've been talking about. So we're not saying that insulin, IGF-1, leptin, etc., induce cancer, but we're saying once you have cancer, let's say it's subclinical, you could in fact cause this progression to occur. So I think it's very important because of the timeline that this period can be a decade or more, and this period can be months to years. Okay, so let me show you why I think hyperinsulinemia is a factor in cancer growth. And remember, this is endogenous hyperinsulinemia. This is the patient's hyperinsulinemia because of their insulin resistance, whether they're obese or type 2. And here's a study by Pam Goodwin. She looked at normal individuals, normal women. She looked at the prognosis from breast cancer, and she did a comparison with their insulin level in the bloodstream. They, divided into quartiles. There's the lower quartile and the upper quartile. And what she showed is those in the upper quartile, which obviously have insulin resistance with endogenous hyperinsulinemia, they're not treated with anything. These individuals had the worst prognosis from breast cancer, strongly suggesting that there's a correlation between hyperinsulinemia, meaning insulin resistance, and a poor prognosis from breast cancer. And we and others have shown this in other models. And so one of the factors that may be driving cancer is insulin resistance and hyperinsulinemia. OK. So to leave time for questions, we, what I'm going to do is I'm going to briefly go through the anti-diabetic medications and ask the question, do they increase risk? Very old study looking retrospectively. So remember, this is epidemiology. It's not, not biology. It's not factual. It's an association. 
Any epidemiologists in the audience? Because I've got to be careful what I say. It's soft data. It's purely an association. It doesn't tell you if there's cause and effect. It just tells you an association. And what you'll see is if you compare the sulfonylureas, which stimulate endogenous insulin, or insulin-based therapy in these diabetic patients, and you compare it to metformin, whether it's given alone, whether it's given with a sulfonylurea, and you compare that with no diabetes treatment, you'll see a separation of the curves. So these are the cumulative tumor-free survival. And it's worse if you're on this curve over here, meaning probably causing endogenous hyperinsulinemia or insulin therapy compared to metformin. Now, the suggestion from this was that metformin may be good for you, and I'm going to come back to it. The suggestion from this is that you're worse off if you're on these therapies. And these therapies go back, the study is 10 years old, they go back 20, 30 years. So these are patients who are on the original insulins that we use, the original sulfonylureas, and there was the separation suggestive that maybe there's a difference between metformin and these therapies. So then, of course, there were many trials. There were many conditions between these trials. There was the advanced, the adopt, the proactive, that's the pioglitazone, many different trials. There was the metformin trial. And so a lot of information has come out from the trials that we've seen. But what happened in 2009 is that four articles, and I'm sure you know this data, four articles came out in Diabetologia suggesting, at least two of them suggesting, that there's a relationship between long-acting glargine insulin and an increased risk of breast cancer. Very controversial because they were registry studies, they weren't control studies, and at least two of them uh, did not stand up to, um, um, to um, evaluation. In fact, one of them, I'm trying to remember which one, one of them is the Swedish study. They published a year later that the data that they published the year before didn't hold up a year later. So it almost was like a retraction. So basically, this led to a lot of concern about using long-acting glargine. And I think there must be 30, 40 publications that have come out subsequently, both epidemiological and research studies. And I think the conclusion, as you heard from other agents as well, the conclusion is that perhaps uh, this was a false alarm. What I want to show you is why this may be a false alarm, because a lot of studies going back 10 years suggested that glargine insulin in the test tube seems to be very mitogenic, seems to stimulate cells to grow, cancer cells. And indeed, what they failed to do was to look at the active component of glargine. Here's the injectable glargine. Here are the intermediate products in the bloodstream. And it turns out that M1, this metabolite, is the one that circulates and is the one that the tissue sees. So if you look, for example, a study by Jerry Boli in Italy, what he shows is when you inject glargine insulin, you can't measure it in the bloodstream, the parent compound. You can't measure hardly M2. What you measure is primarily M1. So it gets metabolized as it gets injected, and this is the circulating form. And when you study that in the, in the test tube, it has no mitogenic activity. Very briefly, uh, here is M1. You'll see there's no mitogenic activity, whereas the parent compound does have some mitogenic activity. So the scare was because of this suggestion that glargine is mitogenic, but actually the circulating form which the tissue sees is not. And then came along the ORIGIN trial, which was a control study between glargine insulin and I think NPH insulin. And they looked at cardiovascular outcomes, they looked at cancer, and there was survival was identical, and there was no increase in cancer. Shown here, if you look at um, the insulin glargine, you'll notice that there's no significant increase in any of the cancers listed here. So I think that most of the agencies at the time said you don't have to worry, and I think now virtually everybody is agreeing that there doesn't seem to be any effect of this long-acting insulin. 
I should say parenthetically, I think with any new insulin analog, one should be careful, one should test its mitogenic activity, and one should always remain vigilant, because we really won't know within a few years of it reaching the market if this is true or not. We have to wait many years to really see uh, the long-term effects, if there's anything truly there. <coughs> so just to summarize with the insulin analogs, the epidemiological studies have conflicting results, the in vitro studies were poorly done, and so far the data suggest that they are apparent, apparently safe. I want to return to metformin again, because this is very interesting. It turns out if you look at metformin, now if you look at this line here, this is unity, this is one, this is one. Anything to the left is actually good, anything to the right is bad, and what you'll notice is that there are some studies with breast cancer, uh, mortality here, for example, from cancers, colon cancer. It looks like the use of metformin may actually be good for you. The epidemiological studies suggest those on metformin have a better outcome. So there's a suggestion that metformin may indeed be, may indeed be good for diabetic patients in terms of also preventing the development of cancer or the progression of cancer. The question is, this just shows the same again. You'll see the metformin effect, uh, which is no metformin, they die quicker. This is with metformin, they don't die so quickly. And I'll take you back to the slide that I showed you before. The high insulin levels, the poor prognosis. And the question is, when you give metformin, what happens to the high insulin levels? And you'll see here that the hyperinsulinemia decreases from 71 to 54, as does your glucose from over 5 to less than 5, and your insulin resistant index drops dramatically. So metformin can reduce your insulin resistance. Secondarily, will reduce your hyperinsulinemia, and that may be the reason why there's an improvement in breast cancer. I didn't bring a slide, but there must be 15 trials that have been started and now ongoing in breast cancer and some other cancers to determine if metformin alone or as adjunct therapy for with chemotherapy is actually going to give us a good outcome in terms of breast cancer and some other cancers. So we'll just have to wait a year or two to truly see that. Oh, I did show it. So here are the various studies that are ongoing, breast cancer being the number one, but some of the other cancers as well. And the question is, how can metformin work? Is it purely by improving metabolism of the patient, the physiology, reduce the insulin resistance, and therefore allow hyperinsulinemia to reduce? And that's basically what I'm showing here, is that uh, there's a reduction in uh, glucose output by the liver, which perhaps is primary effect, and that leads to a reduction of insulin. On the other hand, what's now known is that metformin can have a direct effect on the cancer cell itself. So in most cells, uh, uh, AMP kinase is elevated by metformin. AMP kinase reduces met mTOR, which in fact drives proliferation of the cell. So metformin may have a direct effect on cancer cells, or it may have an effect on reducing the hyperinsulinemia. And like anything, there are two schools of thought. There's the group that thinks it's working as an anti-cancer agent on the cancer cell, and there's the other group who believes that it's improvement in the insulin resistance. They may be both right, uh, they may be both wrong. We'll see. Uh, but in summary, metformin looks like it's good for the patients, and I think when anybody, I think anybody asks you as a uh, healthcare professional, should my patient be on metformin, the usual answer is yes, definitely, if there's no reason not to use it, and now you have another reason to use it, although it's not been FDA approved for this function. Um, but basically what was shown is that the increase in, cal in, in the rodent calcitonin levels is not shown in humans. So if you look at the calcitonin levels in the trials, basically flat. So as you heard, or you perhaps you didn't hear, the GLP-1 receptors which are stimulated in the rodent uh, C cells are not present in the human cells. And I'm just going to, I don't think that uh, Carol touched the SGLT2 inhibitors, but there was some suggestion of bladder cancer. And so far, the uh, various agencies have suggested that the, the data is not strong enough to really suggest that there is an induction of cancer. So 
basically, I think insulin, long acting is now fine. I think as you heard that the GLP-1 agonist and DPP-4 is fine. Metformin is the one that's really good, certainly no discernible and may be protective. And then the TZD so far and the SGLT2s, there doesn't seem to be any evidence that's strong enough to make us worry. So let me just finish with the last two slides, which are basically implications for practice. How does this affect our practice? Well, one thing is cancer screening. You now know, or you have known, that diabetes and obesity increases the risk of cancer, increases the risk for mortality from cancer. We should be more vigilant with the patients who are diabetic and obese. We can use this, if they have cancer, tell them that they really need good control and weight loss. If they don't have cancer, tell them they need weight loss and good control because they can avoid the cancer. So I think connecting the two and screening for cancer is very important. And I think it also has implications for diabetes treatment. So far, we've not seen any evidence that these drugs cause cancer. But the big question will come up is, you have a patient who's on insulin and develops breast cancer. What are you going to do? And I'll leave that for you to decide. Thank you.